What do you think is true in your life now because of things that your dad did back then? Uh, that I'm very independent, uh, very, I have a lot of integrity. If he had been stricter, maybe I wouldn't have done some of the things I did. Those lessons that he taught me in discipline, you know, I've been able to move, to transition into manhood, you know, and to be a responsible, productive member of society. I respect him, but honestly, I don't really like him. He's hard on me, but as long as I do the right thing, he's pretty easy. Sometimes I even think that we're probably too, too lenient. Well, he was a good provider. He took us to church. He, he helped us with our character. I don't think I, I would have become the person I am today if it wasn't for him. Basically, he just turned me into the man that I am today. All right, so how are you doing? Victorville, we're glad to see you. Hesperia, Apple Valley, um, feeling. Yeah, we're glad to see everybody, everybody in the house for this part of our service every weekend. And uh, if you are here or there or virtually anywhere, raise your hand if you need a copy of the outline, copy of the notes, and we'll provide that for you. I think, um, I think it's, uh, st we're still officially in winter, uh, but many of you started your spring break and it feels like the first day of summer out there today. So we live in a very confused culture. Would you not agree? You wouldn't? Okay, well, uh, I'm right on this, so just want to let you know. You need to agree. Today, our uh, passage in this series on being connected to our Heavenly Father, that's uh, the theme for these months of looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. And today, what we're going to do is look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And so if you've been tracking with us in your reading or if you're in a small group, I know you guys are working through a special small groups edition uh, of uh, an Ephesians study that our team's put together. And um, even if you're neither and you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn to that passage. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 is where we'll begin in, uh, in, in a little while. Uh, but today what we're going to see is one of the truly great statements of, of pure theology in the entire New Testament. Uh, but it's not just deep theology, although as you'll see today, it certainly is that. But there's a very practical element to what we're going to share with you as well, because Paul is going to, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to the Ephesian church, he is going to identify the sovereign love and ultimate power of the God who serves as the head of our spiritual household. And he's going to do it in such a manner and with the intended purpose of comforting those of us who struggle in this whole crazy, mixed up world that we live in. And sometimes the fatherhood of God is a very cool uh, element that we keep coming back to when we're wondering if we can find our way in the world. He is the head of our household, and of course that is the title of the presentation. But let's just introduce or reintroduce what we have uh, been sharing now for the last couple of weekends. We are all connected in so many ways at so many different levels. In fact, we're connected to our immediate families, those of you who are attending even this service uh, today with your spouse. You are so connected to your spouse that the Bible says he or she is actually of one flesh with you. It also says that if you try to ignore your responsibilities to your immediate family, then you run the risk of acting worse than a non-believer. I mean, God's word is very clear. We're connected to our homes. We're connected to our oikos, those eight to 15 people whom God has supernaturally and strategically brought into our lives. He brings them onto the front burner of our daily schedules because he wants us to help them discover who he is. We're connected to the ministry teams. When you're involved uh, in a meaningful role here at HDC, you serve with people with a common purpose. And you're connected to them. You're connected to a small group. Those of you who have uh, 
made the effort to get involved in a small group, you know the connection that you're developing and the closeness that you're developing as a group, as you encourage, as you receive encouragement from those other uh, members of your group. You're connected to a specific campus, a specific local community. Those of you here in Victorville will come to the Victorville campus. You usually don't scatter around. This is a connecting point for you. And those who are also over in Hesperia and over in Apple Valley and Phelan, you find the same thing to be true where you have chosen to be a part of this church family. But we're also a family, a fairly large church family. We're all connected to the mission of High Desert Church. And as the body of Christ, as a, as a person who belongs to Jesus, who's been adopted by God, our head of household, into this eternal family we call the church, we're connected to believers that we don't even know. We're connected to believers in different countries, on different continents, those who have come and gone throughout the last 20 or so of centuries. We are connected at that level in Christ. But you guys, none of these connections would be possible unless we recognize the fundamental way that we are all connected to our Heavenly Father, that we are all connected to God. This is not a series devoted to the biblical function of the immediate family. And we have different series like that. We talk about the family because the family is a very important part of, of our daily lives. They're the primary members of our oikos. But this series is not about that. This series will explore the implications of being a member of God's oikos. Even though we haven't even gotten to chapter 2. Look at verse 19 in chapter 2 where the apostle says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. That word in the Greek is oikos. We're so familiar with that word. God has an oikos. It's bigger than each 15 because he frankly can handle that many relationships. But he's narrowed that margin for us so that we can focus on our oikos. But it, and we talk about that week in and week out. But it's a great thing to recognize that we are part of God's household, part of his family part of his oikos. Now, as we look at the passage that we're going to see today, there are a variety of ways that we could read this particular part of the text. You could see this passage through the lens of a loving heavenly father, a heavenly father who's adopted us. He's brought us into his oikos. He is the head of our household. And as our father, he wants us to acclimate to the perks of membership in his household. A couple of weekends ago when I introduced the series to you, I talked about a flight that Cheryl and I had recently taken and how we were the rest of you. We were not part of the MVP gold elite and all the different elite statuses that that particular airline had for frequent flyers. And at the end of that long litany of groups that were allowed to venture into the aircraft, the call came out for the rest of you men on board. And I looked at my wife, and that's who we were. In a few days, we're going to go on another flight to another place, this time on another airline. And just for fun, I looked up what that particular special group would be called on that airline so I could prepare myself spiritually for that moment. <laughs> that airline doesn't have the MVP Gold Elite. That airline has the Gold Star Alliance. Well, I'm not part of the Gold Star Alliance. I will still be part of the rest of you may now board. <laughs> But you know, there, there, there is something really important, and we'll see this replicated throughout the series, not so much the story about the airline, but we'll see this replicated throughout this series at so many junctures along the way throughout this letter where the apostle wants to remind us that we are VIP. We are MVP. We are gold star, gold member, gold something. Because in Christ we have been given a super eternal elite status. And God the Father wants us to understand that. But you could also read this passage through the lens of the, the one who wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Here's an apostle who just loves the Ephesian church. And he wants them as his friends and even as his spiritual children because the apostle Paul was a spiritual father for so many people who claimed to be Christian in this city of Ephesus. He wants them to understand that same vibe 
of gold star alliance, the first class status of being a child of God. But then you can look at this passage through your own lens. An MVP, gold alliance, whatever saint who loves your oikos. And that's actually where we're going to land later on as we we land this thing, no pun intended. Let's go ahead and uh, take off, though, and look at point number one, fill in some blanks. You guys have your notes, your outlines. It says you need to remember, first of all, that people matter more to God than anything. You just have to know that people matter more to God than anything. The reason we're constantly encouraging you to reach out to people is because God really loves them. And what's important to him should be important to us. I always have appreciated throughout the years, even when our kids were very young, I know my wife Cheryl would say the same thing. Whenever there is a compliment about our kids or there's conversation about our kids or somebody would identify something really cool about our kids, that was such a compliment to us because our kids really mattered to us. And if you love my kids, you were my friend. And uh, if you didn't love my kids, I don't know what you're smoking, but you need to stop it because you should. Everybody should love my kids. And I know you feel that way about your kids, but it's important for you to recognize that God feels that way about us. And even those who don't know Christ, he wants to bring them into his eternal family because he loves them too. Anyway, chapter one, verse 15, here we go. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you, in my prayers. What did you remember to do today? Now, I I know that for some of you, the day's been a few hours. Some, it's been more than that, depending on how well you sleep or what your routine or your schedule is. But if you're like me, there are a lot of things today that you've already forgotten to do that you thought about doing before the day began. That's why we make lists, I suppose couple of older um, couples were having coffee together and one of the guys name was Harry and and he started telling his friend about this really terrific restaurant that he and his wife had had eaten at the night before and his friend asked him what the name of the restaurant was and after thinking for a few seconds uh, Harry said well what are those really good smelling flowers called again his friend said you mean a rose he said yeah that's it hey rose looking at his wife What was the name of that restaurant that we ate at last night? I'm glad you found humor in that. Sometimes sometimes I get all excited about telling you stories, and then I tell the story, and you guys are like, anyway, all right, so for the 15 of you that laugh, thank you. It is something, though, that happens not just to aging couples, not just to aging individuals, although now at 60, I'm finding that to be true so much more than in the past. I just can't remember what I was going to say next. But anyway, (laughs) if you can't seem to remember as well as you used to be able to remember, um, maybe you need to make lists. And maybe you have a list. In fact, maybe you made a list yesterday for the weekend or you made a list a couple of days ago for the coming week or maybe with spring break now upon us, you've got lists going on. Well, what's on your list? Because what's on your list is what's important. See, that's why we ask you to fill out an Oikos card. Because that gives you the opportunity to write down the names of people who are really important to God and should be really important to you. Because if you don't have a list, what will you tend to do? You'll forget. I love that the apostle said, I remembered you. In fact, I haven't stopped remembering you. Oftentimes we use the excuse, out of sight, out of mind, right? Ah oh, man, I just forgot about that or forgot about them or forgot about that need because I hadn't seen them for a while and out of sight, out of mind. Well, you can't use that excuse with your oikos because they're never out of sight very far, are they? God has brought them right there to you and you see them often. You interact with them on a regular basis. Actually, it had probably been four years since the apostle Paul had seen or spent time with the Ephesian Christians. Four years but he still remembered them. In the reports and the correspondence that he'd received since that last meeting, that face-to-face meeting that he had had with them, he had been told of their love for Jesus. He had been told of their love 
for God's people. And by the way, those two things are inseparable. You see this in all of the apostolic literature. You see this in the words of Christ. Jesus said, if you don't love the people I love, then don't tell me that you love me. In fact, years later, as Jesus analyzed the Ephesian church, right now, you know, in history, the Ephesian church had been planted. The apostle Paul had established elders. He'd encouraged them on a number of occasions. And now, years later, he's in a Roman prison and he's corresponding with the Ephesian church, encouraging them in their faith. Well, years later still, when the Apostle John has that terrific vision that we call the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first couple of chapters are all about Jesus analyzing his church. And when he comes to the Ephesian church, this very same group of people whom Paul is writing now. Now remember, we're fast forwarding when we get to the book of Revelation. But Jesus said this in Revelation chapter 2 verse 2. He said, I know how you live. I know your deeds. I know your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. I know that you got that going on. You know that you are living a separated life, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. You know your doctrine. You know your theology. You found those false teachers to be exactly what they are, to be false. You've persevered. You've endured hardships for my name, and you haven't gotten tired of it. See, that's, that's the good side. But then he says, yet I hold this against you. Can you imagine Jesus saying that to High Desert Church? I hold something against you. He said, you've forsaken the love you had at first. Now scholars are divided over whether the love that they lost was their love for Jesus. Some have suggested that it's their love for people. I would suggest that they go hand in hand. And when you lose your love for people, you lose your first love, which is your love, that passion that you have to serve Christ. And by the way, you can't pick and choose which people you want to love because it's very clear here in this passage, Paul says, your love for all of God's people. When you think about it, and I know you do, Think about the people who are easy to love and the people who are not so easy to love. Let me just put it out there for you. When it came to Jesus coming to this earth 2,000 plus years ago as an expression of God the Father's love for us to save us and redeem us, I just want you to know there was only one category of people and that category were the people that were really hard to love. I mean, look at you. How much time do you spend talking to Jesus? How much time do you spend serving him? How much time do you spend thinking about him? Even now, after so many weeks or months or years of being in the family of God, don't you still, like virtually all of us, default to thinking about yourself before you think about others, before you think about him? And he still loves us. You know, if there's one thing that really makes me sad, I'd say angry, but that wouldn't be very Christian now. <laughs> but, but I'm sad, is pettiness. Pettiness and how people get their nose bent out of shape and their feelings hurt. And they stop loving based on the performance of their family or friends. And you haven't shown me the kind of love that I deserve or the kind of respect that I deserve. And so I guess we're done, at least for now, until you grovel and get on your knees and ask me to forgive you or beg me to allow you back into my life. I mean, I, even saying that is kind of making me have a touch of the nausea. That we would think so highly of ourselves that we cannot love the people whom God left heaven to be born and live a pretty difficult life and die the most cruel death devised by mankind for you and I who are not very lovable. And then to think about what he's done for us. And this whole theme of Ephesians, 
and how he's taken us from the category of lost, spiritually dead, with hearts of stone. And he's quickened us to life in Christ and made us MVP gold elite. You'll see more of that in a few minutes. I told you a couple weekends ago when I teach the book of Ephesians, it's a long process because I just stop. It's like being on a trip. And you're driving along in some of the most fabulous parts of the country. And sometimes you just have to stop and take it all in. And roll the window down and turn off the engine. You know, and just smell the smell and, and see the visual grandeur of whatever it is you're visiting. Maybe it's a national park. And that's how I am in this letter. I just have to stop and take pause and reflect on this incredible God who took me and made me somebody. Fill in some more blanks while I emote here a little more. Uh, never give up on your own people. Never give up on your own people. You got to remember them and then you got to make sure you never give up on them. You see, Jesus gave you your own people. He tells us that in Mark chapter 5, verse 19. And again, looking at our oikos, those he supernaturally and strategically placed in our lives. And you can't give up on them. Now, let me just break this down for you as to how life goes with people and relationships. And this is not going to be news to you. It's certainly not what we call rocket science. But there are three groups of people. I call it the 20-60-20 principle, and I've shared this in the past, but I'll just share it again. You break down your oikos, and it's not that hard to do. You look at 20, 60, and 20%. You're only talking about 15 people, so this shouldn't be too hard for anybody. But 20% of the people that you are reaching out to, they will, they will tend to, I won't even say they will respond, but they will tend to respond rather quickly because that's the way 20% of the people in our lives are. And so we know that going in. You can almost look at your list on, on your, your Oikos card and you can say, well, who's the few that just seem to respond so quickly? And then on the other side, there are 20% that may never respond. And you may not even know who's in that 20% yet because you're not going to give up on any of them. And so that might be something for the people to sort out after you die who those 20% were, but that's just the way it is. I mean, you look at even Jesus' oikos, and you had Judas, and Judas fell off the wagon, and he didn't make, you know, the traveling squad. And so all I'm saying is that here we have Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of everything, and there were even, or was even, an individual in his oikos that did not give his heart to Jesus. But then you, you have the 20 that respond quickly. You got the 20 that may never respond, but then you have the 60%. And that 60% make up the focus for what God is going to accomplish through your life. And again, sometimes you can't differentiate between the 60 and this 20. You don't know who's who yet. But this 60 are the people that will come to faith if you just persist. At a birthday party, it came time to serve the cake, and a little guy named Brian blurted out, I want the biggest piece. Mother scolded him. It's not polite to ask for the biggest piece. Brian looked at her and said, well, then how am I supposed to get it? <laughs> Same 15 left. I appreciate you guys more now than ever. <laughs> I love Brian's attitude. He's going to hang in there. He's going to persist. Look at what Paul said. If you don't like Brian, look at what Paul said. No, you guys didn't feel in love, your Pastor Brian. That's not the Brian in the story. Anyway, verse 17, I keep asking. I keep asking. It's been four years. And yet he continues to remember them, and he keeps asking because he will not give up on the Ephesians. And what's he asking? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That was Paul's desire, that the Ephesian people would know God better. And he keeps pushing them in prayer. He can't be with them. He can't say much to them. He writes. They write back, correspondence, word of mouth. But there's not a lot of FaceTime. And so, so many of the conversations that he has about the Ephesians, he has before the throne of God. I keep asking that God 
the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father may give you that spirit of wisdom and revelation. There's nothing wrong with pushing people to God because we care about them. That's why Paul kept asking God to give them understanding. They knew some things. They understood some things. There's nobody in this room that doesn't understand something about God. But that's our prayer for one another that we would understand still more. That spirit of wisdom, you'll notice the capital S. The spirit is the spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's not just a, a sense. It's not like, okay, I have a spirit of fear here. I mean, that spirit has a name. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does a number of things for us. The ministry of the Spirit is profound in what, it, what he provides us. And, and we've talked about a few of those things already in our study last weekend. Uh, we talked about how he has sealed us in Christ. His presence guarantees our inheritance. That's what the Holy Spirit does when he comes into our lives. The fact that he's there is a guarantee. He has sealed us. And he gives us wisdom. The Holy Spirit gives us the spirit of wisdom. Another of his roles is that the Holy Spirit always reveals the Father. And if you're a spirit-filled Christian today, you are understanding the Father more and more as the revelation the Holy Spirit gives you makes that connection that you have to the Father more clear. The knowledge of God, this wisdom, this knowledge, this understanding always has a purpose. And the purpose of knowledge is to always be what? To always be more useful to God. Paul, the apostle, same guy, different letter, different church he wrote to, but he said that knowledge without a functional end game simply makes us sinfully proud. If you don't have a reason for what you're learning about God, then there really is no reason to learn it. In fact, if you're not careful, he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, if you're not careful, that knowledge that you have about God will just make you sinfully proud. Knowledge without love. That's why you cannot separate your worship of God from your service to God's people. You remember what my dad used to say, and I shared this, I think, in the last series, but Pastor Frank always used to say, God's spirit will apply God's word in the lives of God's people to conform them to the image of, of God's son and therefore bring about the fulfillment of God's will. God's word. God's people. We come to learn the word of God. But that knowledge of God as it is revealed through his word must always be focused on the love that God wants to extend to people. Because that is the process through which God is building his kingdom. And you cannot separate the two. You cannot pretend that you're going to start serving people without understanding good theology. Because if you don't understand the word of God, you're going to serve people the wrong way. And, and at times you may even do more harm than good. By your service to them, it might, may harm them because it's not founded on biblical principles that are absolutely true. Conversely, you can't sit there week in and week out or open your Bible every morning and just say, oh God, I just want to understand you. I want to understand. I want to build my knowledge base because that knowledge base will just make you proud and you'll sit around thinking about how much more you know than the other people in your small group or how much more you know than the pastor, which really isn't raising the bar very high, how much more you know, or even as a church family, how much more we know than the church down the street or another denomination or another you know, faction of the body of Christ. We start thinking that we are so smart because we lost sight of the whole purpose and that's that people would know God. People matter more to God than anything. And that's the end game. Here, fill in a few more blanks. Point number three, interceding for others helps us focus on eternity. Interceding for others helps us focus on eternity. You know, you have these prayer cards that we distribute. We don't have them in your programs today. I don't believe on any of our campuses, but I do know they're available in each of the lobbies of all four of our sites. And you can grab one of those cards and you can make a list of those eight to 15 people God actually has put on the front burner of your life right now. And you can start praying for them. And that's what intercession is. It's praying for others. It's standing in the gap between two people. You got God and you got them. And here you are in the middle. And you're praying to God on behalf of them. 
You're interceding for them. Why? Because they just need something. You'll find out what it is in a minute. But one of the primary benefits of your taking a card and remembering that people matter more to God than anything and not giving up but persisting on a daily basis and bringing them to the throne of God, one of the benefits is that it takes your eyes off of what is temporal and, and lifts your eyes onto the horizon of eternity because your prayers for them will matter forever. Interceding for others. So what are we praying for? Well, he says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, which by the way, the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing us, the riches of our glorious inheritance. His glorious inheritance in his holy people. Our friends and family, we'll look at verse 19 in a minute. It's really that verse 18 and the first part of 19. Actually, if you're a small group, that's the memory verse for this week. So that's really important. But we'll finish up that statement in a, in a couple of minutes. But I'm just looking at that right now. I pray. This is what we're interceding for. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You know, in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, we talk about hope. The word hope in the Greek, it's, it's elpis. It's this little rabbit trail. It's not really part of our primary focus. It's not in your notes. But that word actually means favorable expectation. When the Greeks had a hope, see, when I have a hope, I might be hoping that, you know, my Bruins are going to get into March Madness. I'm hoping that. And if you're tracking the Bruins, it's kind of iffy. They're on the bubble. So I'm hoping. Do I have a favorable expectation? Not really, because I'm not really sure. I'm hoping. But when we talk in our vernacular about hope, that's what we're referring to. We're just kind of hoping. For the Greeks, it was much more than that. Paul says, I want you to have a favorable expectation to what he has called you. That is a confidence. Hope to the Greeks is a confident hope. And Paul wants the eyes of their hearts to be enlightened, that they can see what they have in Christ. Story about William Randolph Hearst, and a really rich guy of past generation, been to Hearst Castle up in what is it, San Simeon up there on the central California coast. It's a beautiful, very lavish estate. And it's just incredible uh, to tour. But he was an art collector, and there was a piece of art he saw in a journal that he wanted. And so his resources were unlimited. So he commissioned one of his assistants to find that piece of art and buy it. Guy took a couple of years, went around the world tracking it down. You know where he found it? In one of the warehouses that William Randolph Hearst already owned. Guy had this incredible piece of artwork and he didn't even know he had it. That's the point here. I'm praying that you may understand what you have in Christ, not what you're going to get. This is not what you can have in Jesus. This is what you already have in Jesus. You just don't know it yet. The Holy Spirit is not only guaranteeing this, that you're going to have this like forever. So you're not going to lose what you have in Christ. But not only are you not going to lose what you have in Christ, you have so much more than you think you have in Christ. Talk about hope. Talk about inheritance, the riches of his inheritance. And in a second, we'll talk about power. You know the friends that you and I have in our oikos, on our card, and, and there are some who don't know Christ, and there are some who know the Lord, but they're kind of wandering away, and then there are some who might be with you even in the service today and they're really tracking with the Lord and you're hoping that they continue. It doesn't matter who's on that card. They need to know God better. You need to know God better. You need to have your name on somebody else's card. Maybe cards. Maybe a couple of hundred people's cards. Because man, you need a lot of prayer. They need to intercede for you just like you need to intercede for them. And once again, it's not, Lord, help us to get more of you. You can't get more of God than you have the day you invite him into your life. He moves in lock, stock, and barrel. He's ready to rock and roll. You get all of him. But your understanding has been mitigated by your lack of intentionality 
in seeing him for who he really is. And part of that's not even your fault. Maybe you haven't been taught. Part of that is your fault because you haven't taken the time. And I'm not here to chastise you. I'm in the same boat as you. I'm just saying there's more to this that we already have been given in Christ than we right now know. And I hope you will pray for me that the eyes of Pastor Tom's heart can be enlightened and that I could see God in, in more, of, more of his glory. That I would be more confident. That I would recognize his incredible riches that I have been given in Christ. Because I have that, just like you do. I've been a Christian for 53 years. If you've been a Christian for five minutes, I have no more than you have. I just know more about it than you do. But I still need to learn more still. I still need to learn more still. See, that's a redundancy. I, I still need to still learn more still, still. Point number four. Try to cover up how stupid I sound sometimes with humor. And I'm, I can always count on 15 people. That's, that's the best part of it. I sure hope you guys in Apple Valley are laughing more than these people are right now. I can only hope. Number four, expect impact because that's what God does. Expect impact because that's what God does. You're, you're going to remember them. You're going to persist. You're not going to stop remembering them. You're going to intercede for them. And then you're going to expect something. Not expect something from them so much as expect something from God about them, I guess. Verse 19, here's his incomparably great power. We, we pray, Paul prays for us, the Ephesians, that the eyes of our heart can be enlightened, know the hope so we can be more confident. We can know the riches of our inheritance because we are his holy people. We are that MVP, gold elite group. And thirdly, his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. See, if we pray for people, we're praying that they will have impact because this, this, there's another ripple of this oikos wave that's created generationally throughout history. And not only can we pray that there would be impact in their lives, but that they would have impact in the lives of others. But if people make the kind of impact that changes the world, it's because we are able, they are able, whoever we're talking about is able to transfer their dependence, our dependence, off of our own capabilities and onto the capabilities of Jesus. It's the way it's always been. It's called faith. You're transferring dependence when you have faith. The first day that you came to Christ, you said, I'm no longer to count on my own performance, my own abilities. I can't count on myself to get myself to heaven because I'm not doing very well. And the Bible says you can't do that. So by faith, we transfer our dependence of our, for our own salvation, eternal salvation, onto Jesus. Now we're depending on him. Now we're depending on what it means to be in Christ. Not what it means to be Tom Mercer for me, but what it means to be Tom Mercer in Christ. See, that is a transference of dependence. Now I come to a situation I cannot, I cannot fix. And that's okay, I can't fix it because I'm not depending on my ability to fix it. I have transferred my dependence onto Jesus because I believe he can fix it. Do you understand that? That's, that's all this is about. Now, can we trust his ability to fix things? This is why it's, it's really good when people understand this passage. When the eyes of your heart truly are enlightened and you're able to understand confidently in terms of your eternal riches and his incomparable great power for those of us who are in Christ. What happens is you don't any longer have to be in control of your life. You don't have to be a control freak anymore. Can I use the word freak? You freak? Yeah, I can. Yes, I can. I can because that's what you are. You're a control freak. Not everybody. To some degree, all of us, some of you are like off the charts. You got to control everything. This is what you need to do. When you understand how much control God has, now you can transfer dependence 
for your difficult situation that you're so trying to just keep those strings you know, pulled and, and manipulating the situation and making it happen. Now you can just rest in Christ and trust him because now you understand you don't have to control it because if you control it, it's not gonna be very good anyway, right? Because you're, you're horrible at this. But if he controls it, then you can trust that. All right, I've been on that soapbox long enough. Transferring our capabilities or transferring trust for life from our capabilities onto Jesus' capabilities. Now, Tom Addington wrote a paper about power, and he, he talked, a guy named Thomas Addington, the paper is entitled Life at Work, and he talks about power in two different categories, positional power and personal power. Now, I, I, it, it, let me just tell you what this is. Positional power is our ability to act on the basis of our position, our station, or our platform in life. In the corporate world, it's measured by your title. If you are the CEO, if you are the president, you have positional power. Somebody introduces you. I'd like to introduce you to the CEO of our company. Immediately, that guy has some power, and it's vested in his position. You could talk about salary is positional power. You make more, you've got more power. If you're in the NBA, your coach makes a couple million dollars a year and you make like $30 million a year, what's the coach gonna do? You have more power, that's what's wrong with sports. And then you talk about the number of employees that we might have in the organization under our control. The more employees, the greater the power. Whether we drive our own car, have access to a limousine, you know, there's power, whether you are um, MVP Gold Elite or the rest of you, there is positional power. Now, this is the thing. The President of the United States, regardless of your political persuasion, regardless of who holds the office, that's positional power. When you're no longer President, you don't have Air Force One at your beck and call. When a corporate CEO retires, he relinquishes the right to the uh, corner office. Why? Because power is positional. Then there's personal power. Personal power is based on moral authority. It flows from the inside out. It's not something that somebody necessarily hands you. It's something that you develop over time because it's tied to your reputation. It means that if you lose your reputation, you lose this. Now, comparing them this way doesn't mean that personal power is good and positional power is bad because both types of power can either be abused or neglected. Both types can be leveraged to accomplish great things. They're just different kinds of power. The Bible tells stories of people who failed to exercise their positional power correctly and the circumstance suffered as a result. The Bible also describes people who use both personal and positional power to accomplish great things. So it's not like one's good and one's bad necessarily. But the reason I say all of this is why Jesus' power is incomparable because he holds the ultimate position as the second member of the Godhead. You know, at the, at the feet of Jesus, you know, every knee will bow because of who he is. But he also has this incredible integrity. His perfect integrity gives him incredible moral authority. And so we look at that passage and we see what Paul is going to do in describing the power that Jesus has. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted. Now, in reading that, you might not recognize, and I don't expect you to if, um, until you hear what I'm going to tell you next. These are four different Greek words. It's not that Paul is just saying he's really, really, like really, really powerful. I mean, that's what we would say, right? No, no, really powerful. He wants to help us understand different levels of Jesus' power, which makes him incomparable. That power, the dunamis, Greek word, is the same as the mighty kratos, strength, iskus. He exerted energeia when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly realms. Dunamis, does that sound, the Greek dunamis sound like something that we would think about in terms of power and the English word would be? Dynamite, that's it, that's where we get our word. And that's, that's called inherent power. Jesus has power because of who he is, because of his position, because of how he lived, because of his moral integrity. And that power 
is like the kratos. Now, what is that word? Maybe it would not be quite the rapid connection you'd have with the first word, kratos. In the Eng we get our English word crater from kratos. Talks about endowed power. Talks about what power does, a crater. The mighty strength, iskus is the Greek word. And here's a word that we get from iskus, eschaton, or the study of eschatology, which is the study of what? The last days. And if you've read the book of Revelation, you know what happens during the last days. There's a lot of things popping during the last days. It is the end, the final word. That he, Jesus, exerted energeia. What's the power word that we get out of energeia? Energy, and that refers to operative power. You guys, that's a lot of pop. Let me show you a picture. Just looking at the Kratos crater. This is the meteor crater, just uh, about 30 miles east of Flagstaff. I don't know if you guys have seen it. We've traveled that road so many times. But a 160-foot wide meteor hit that at 29,000 miles per hour. The meteor itself, and this was a while ago, actually, but you say, oh, I missed that on the news. It, it happened a long time before you were born. But the impact was so great, the meteor itself vaporized for the most part. There are fragments around. And yet this is what is left. You know what we call that? We call that impact. Something that people see, that, and, and we will never ever forget that something happened here. In fact, you can actually, if you look, closely, you can actually see that 160 foot impact circle. And, and it hit there, but it created this. I can't even use this to compare the power of Jesus. Let me tell you why. Because Paul said the power of Jesus is incomparable. There's nothing we could show you that would begin to tell the story about what kind of juice we got when we were plugged in to Jesus. And then as, I'm, I gotta stop, but, well, I don't have to, but I should. In verse 21, far above, I'll, I'll be fast, far above, watch this, comparably great power for us who believe. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, why is that significant for the Ephesians? The Ephesians, it's interesting, they knew all about spiritual activity, sorcery, witchcraft, the magical arts. They knew what it was like to invoke the name of a spiritual creature. When you see rule and authority and dominion, power and dominion in verse 21, he's not talking about kings and presidents and governors and supervisors and, you know, policemen and military. He's talking about spiritual entities. And Ephesus was a hotbed of spiritual activity. And this is what he says. Jesus is far. You know those guys you deal with all the time? Those sorcerers, those magicians? It's really two different conversations. Jesus is so far above whatever the world can throw at you in terms of power. Whatever spiritual forces are in play. Angels, including Lucifer, are very powerful creatures. And they're designed by God. And that's the authorities and the rulers and the powers and the dominions. That, that Paul is describing here. And angels are not, I keep telling you this, they're not dead humans. Evolutionists believe that monkeys evolved into human beings. And some people believe that people evolve into angels. And that's, it's not true. There is no record outside of a Hollywood script. There is no record of a cross-species transformation ever taking place. You are you and you will always be you. Eternally, you'll be a different format. But you will always be you. You're not going to turn into an angel. And when I hear people say, I hope my dead relative is now watching over me. You don't want your dead relative watching over you. I mean, I'm sorry if that, maybe I shouldn't even say that. Maybe you've lost somebody recently and that's hard for you. And I'm, 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 I'm so I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said what I just said the way I just said it. But I said it. So let's break it down. The one you want looking over you is Jesus. Because he's better than any angel. And believe me, the angels the Bible describes really are angels, are far more formidable than your dead relatives could ever be. Okay, I said it. I'm going to skip over a couple of slides to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. 
God placed all things under Jesus' feet, appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. See, if you are a member of God's oikos, then God is your head of household. And that's a huge thing to know. You need to know that. Because the head of your household is so much more powerful. I mean, incomparably so. Far beyond anything that you think could be, should be, will be accomplished by any other power, any other ruler, any other dominion, spiritual or physical. Jesus has got it going on beyond that to a degree that we cannot even compare anything in our context to. Don't you ever forget that. Because then you can transfer dependence onto him. Now, I think maybe you're starting to understand a little bit more about that, even after three weeks of this study. When we're done in a couple of months, you guys are going to be men's level when it comes to this stuff, relative to the rest of the body of Christ. Because you are, many of you, maybe 20% of you are still going to go, I don't know what he's talking about. And 20% of you already get it. But the 60%, the bulk of you in the middle, you're going to slowly acclimate to this, and it's going to light you up like never before. And it's not just going to happen to you, it's going to happen to the people around you because you're going to start praying what we already learned today. Now, I'm talking here in Victorville, but I'm talking to Phelan and Hesperia and Apple Valley as well. I want every one in each one of our sites to look at the bottom on the back of your notes, and you'll see the same prayer reflected that Paul prayed for the Ephesians. Only right now, I want you to pray that for someone in your oikos. And this is what we're going to recite this in a minute. Out loud, all of us. Glorious Father, just like Paul prayed, I give you thanks for whoever. I don't even know who it's going to be for you. I ask that you, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would give that person the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better. I pray that the eyes of that person's heart may be enlightened to know the hope to which you have called him or her, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people and your incomparably great power for that person and the rest of us who believe. Can you stop right now? The Lord's going to give you a name. And that name is someone on your Oikos card. It might be somebody who's a new Christian. It might be somebody who's been a Christian a long time. It might be somebody who's a better Christian than you are. They, they just know God better than you do. But you are going to intercede for them right now. You're going to remember them. You're going to persist this week with this prayer for that person. I know you will do this because you, you will. I just believe you will. You'll do this in your groups. You'll do this maybe with your families, with your friends. You might do it just with you. But I want you to fill in the name that God has given you right now. It might be your spouse. It might be one of your kids. It might be one of your grandkids. It might be a close friend. But that person is a believer. And there are people in your oikos, my oikos, who are already believers. It's not just non-believers. For me, the first name that always comes to mind for me is my wife, Cheryl. 35 years later, still the love of my life. One of the most godly, deepest women in Christ I've ever met. One of the greatest counselors any husband could ever have. I thank God for her every day. I remember her in my prayers every day. But I'm going to put her name on my list this week, and maybe some others as well, but she's always at the top. And this is what I'm going to pray for her. What name did God give you? Write it down. Write it down. Okay. We've run out of time already, but frankly, I'm not even hungry yet, so we can sit here for as long <laughs> as you want me to sit here. If you don't write it down, maybe you don't have a pen, and that's fine. If you don't have a pen, think about that person, because I'm going to ask you to look at your notes or look on screen, and we're going to say that name out loud. And you might be sitting next to the person that you're going to say their name. And I don't want you to be ashamed of that because basically what that means is that person is dear to your heart and you're praying and interceding for them, not only today, but all week. Are you ready? Okay, let's all stand together. And let's just pray this prayer for all the people. We come to that individual name. We're gonna say that person's name. If, if, you, if you say Cheryl, you better have your own Cheryl. Okay, and also just a little heads up, for all of you on the other sites in here in Victorville, when you come to the him or her, don't say him, her. 
okay? <laughs> figure out right now, take an extra couple of seconds, figure out right now what the gender might be so that when we get down here, we're good. You ready to go? Okay, let's pray together as a church family. Glorious Father, I give you thanks for Cheryl. I ask that you, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would give Cheryl the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better. I pray that the eyes of Cheryl's heart may be enlightened to know the hope to which you have called her, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people, and your incomparably great power for Cheryl and the rest of us who believe. I just prayed one of the greatest theological prayers written in the word of God for someone that I love, and you did too. And I want you to do that again and again and again all week. And in the process, you're not only going to be interceding for that individual, you're also going to be learning the scriptures. Go ahead and have a seat. Let's just pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us today to um, open our own hearts, even ask your Holy Spirit to open our hearts to the possibilities of praying for people and seeing impact reverberating throughout the world. As your kingdom continues to progress, we live in a very confused and ugly world at times, Father, one that you sent your son to die for. And we are the beneficiaries of that great work on the cross. We'll be celebrating in just a few weeks again at Easter. But Lord, right now we are praying for these people that we love. And I pray that you would answer this great prayer for, for all of these people that you have brought into your forever family, that you have become the head of their household. And we want them, like ourselves, to know you at levels we've never known you before. Everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed. And if you're a believer, then you are like tracking with things that we've said to this point. But if you don't know Christ, then I would suggest that your name has been on someone's card for a while now. And they may might be part of the HTC family. They might not be. They might not even live in, in our community or our communities. But people have been praying that you would know him and that that initial transference of, of faith from you to Jesus would take place at some point. And perhaps this is the day. Perhaps it's the day that you would begin your spiritual walk by saying, Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need you. I believe that you are the one that can save me, that Jesus can save me and no one else. No one else can help me but Jesus. And I choose to transfer my dependence off of myself and onto Jesus right now. I give Jesus my life. I ask that he would be my savior and my leader as I leave this place today and forever in Jesus' great name we pray, amen.